We're doing a, a series called Stronger and Stronger in the Lord. Let's pray. We're going to jump right into that. Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight that we have the opportunity to, to, to break open your word, to learn, to grow. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher. Thank you for your anointing that changes things and opens hearts. And so, Father, tonight we are open in our heart. We want to learn from you. We want to learn how to become stronger, that we might glorify you in our lives. And for that, we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to do something a, a little different tonight. I'm going to back up a little bit. And uh, as I was, was going over some of this, uh, I realized sometimes I can get ahead of myself and not explain some things well. And so I want, I want to go back over. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about something in, more in depth tonight. And we just feel, how many of you believe we can just, we can just be led? Just, would you prefer I be led or just do something wrong? Okay. That was kind of a rhetorical question, but anyway, it's, it's uh, I would prefer to be led. And so I want to talk about something tonight, but we, we, our text has been Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, this is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. By the way, those of you who are reading the um, Bible 365 with us, I hope all of you are reading Bible 365. If uh, one chapter a day, five days a week, you read through the entire New Testament, it's a good thing to do. And if you're reading right now, we're in, we're in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is what they call a pastoral letter. And Paul's writing to Timothy, who is a pastor. He was the pastor of this church at Ephesus. And so when Paul is writing, and in fact, Ephesians is considered one of his really great doctrinal books. And so he's writing the, the church at Ephesus. And he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So we begin to ask the question, what does that even look like? When someone says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, what's that mean? And so we want to talk about that. And we've been talking about it and we've been using as a template some of the things that Jesus did, four things that Jesus did in Luke, the fourth chapter, verses one through four. And Jesus is our example. He said, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterwards, when, he had in, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And so we talked about four things. The first thing we talked about was, uh, again, using Jesus as our example, that Jesus was dependent on the Holy Spirit's help. I, I, can't, I can't emphasize that enough. I think so much of the time we have relegated the Holy Spirit off to a corner and haven't realized, but we spent 10 weeks. I think we spent 10 weeks talking about his ministry. He still is the, the third person of the Godhead, God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And so he is, he is vital. He is here. He is, he is our helper. We couldn't do this church without him. We couldn't do life without him. We need his help. And so learning to lean on him and depend on him is so important. And here's the thing. If Jesus was led by the Spirit and filled with the Spirit, wouldn't it be a good idea if we were? Amen. And so if, if it worked for Jesus, then I'm like, I'm a candidate. I'm all in. So depending on the Holy Spirit's help, second thing is don't allow feelings and fleshly desires to dominate you. If you're going to be strong in the Lord, you're going to have to say, learn to say no to your fleshly desires and feelings. And we talked about the fact that Jesus did not eat for 40 days. He didn't say he didn't drink. You can't go that long without water. But he didn't eat for 40 days. And afterwards he was hungry and then uh, the enemy tempted him. But 40 days he said no. Now how many of you know one of the strongest driving forces that will, that will move your flesh is hunger? <laughs> my parents used to, used to say, and I, I, never, I didn't think about it until later, but my parents used to say, I've got a hunger pain. Anybody, was, um, am I the only family that ever did that? I've, 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 I've heard, okay. I got, uh, and my mom looked at my dad and he'd go, I have a hunger pain. And uh, that meant we were going we to eat something soon. And what I didn't realize is for many of us who, who have grown up uh, after that generation, my parents' generation was impacted by the depression. He actually had gone hungry in his life. And if you've ever gone hungry, then hunger pain's probably very real. And so, you know, if you've never fasted before, and maybe you don't know what a hunger pain is, try that. You, you will find out. 
your body will talk to you. You're going, why are you not feeding me? I am, I am very hungry. And so Jesus had the ability to tell his, his flesh no. You know, that's the, that's the purpose of, of fasting. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to fast and pray. It's going to change God. Fasting does not change God. Fasting changes us. Do you understand God's not moved if you fast or not? I'm, I fasted for three days, Lord. He doesn't owe you anything because you fasted for three days. What happens is by fasting, what we do is we learn to say no to our flesh. It's a good discipline. And so people say, well, should I fast for 40 days like Jesus? I, I would never recommend that. <laughs> I, I really would. Just, just I, I've known people that have done 40 day fast and they wind up weird. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm being very serious. They wind up weird. One guy came back and said he had a revelation that, you know, he was supposed to divorce his wife, just left his, just divorced her, sent her home. No other reason except he was fasting and said he heard from the Lord. He didn't hear from the Lord. He was hallucinating. That's the, and if you don't eat for 40 days, you're going to see some stuff. Visions of Whataburger. And, uh, <laughs> but I digress. All right. So just, but if you, if you never have fasted, I, I would encourage you to try it. And, uh, and again, do it when you have an opportunity maybe to spend some extra time with the Lord or fast certain things. Maybe you fast dessert or fast sugar or fast. I think every, every January that I fast hot tamales, the, 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 the candy. Somehow I'm, 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 I'm feeling sarcasm come my way. And I just, <laughs> but I really like hot tamales. And Sundays is my day to watch football and eat hot tamales. And, and so I go no to that. And uh, they'll call to me. I hear them out of the, uh, out of the pantry. <laughs> but you, you had to be able to tell, you, tell them no. Here's what, here's what I wanted to go back into just a little bit more because I don't feel like I gave it enough justice last week. And, and I want to talk to this because I really think this is a key thing to being strong in the Lord. The enemy challenged Jesus on who he was in terms of his spiritual identity. He challenged him. He said, if you're the son of God. He didn't challenge him on whether he was a man or whether he was Jewish he challenged him on, on the spiritual claim that he had made that he was the son of God. And so I think it's, it's I want to talk just a little bit more about understanding and, and getting stronger and developing in our spiritual identity, because I think this is where one, some of the challenges really do come in. Uh, we can learn from John the Baptist. John the Baptist, let's read the verse. Remember, John the Baptist was a, a relative, actually a cousin of Jesus. And uh, he was before Jesus. He was a precursor of Jesus. So let's read about John the Baptist. Now, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. He said, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. He said, are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. John the Baptist, when he had started something in Israel, that when John the Baptist showed up, they hadn't seen anything like him in a while. There'd been no prophet. There'd been no prophetic voice. There really had been nothing for about 400 years. And when John the Baptist showed up, it really stirred up that whole area. People were going out to be baptized. It was, a, it was a move of God. But John's whole ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus. But when John showed up, they began to say, who are you? They were, they were always, the Jews were always looking for the Messiah. And so they, they asked John, are, are, you, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? John knew who he was not. And he said, no, I'm not, I'm not him. I'm not Elijah. I'm, I'm not the prophet. And so they asked him the question. They said, well, then who are you? So we got, we, got to, we, got to tell, we got to tell people who you are. Who are you? He didn't say I'm the greatest thing to hit Israel in 400 years. He didn't say I'm the best preacher you have seen in a long time. He didn't say anything but what he said. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. So what John did was John went to the scriptures to identify who he was. So he identified himself from the scriptures. And that's what he said. He didn't say anything other than this is who I am. 
I am what the prophet Isaiah said. So John, somewhere in his life, had heard about his supernatural birth. He had heard about all the miracles that took place around it. But somewhere in his upbringing, John began to find out from the scriptures that this is who he was. And that's who John said he was. They asked him, and that's what came out of him. Now, when Joe McGee was here, he said something that triggered my attention when he said Jesus had defined himself in the scriptures. And as I, as I heard that, I, 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 it, it, it immediately registered with me. But I'm thinking, is that right? Is, did Jesus have to find himself in the scriptures? And I want you to stay with me just for a second. Because sometimes people want to put Jesus in such a, a different category that you don't realize that Jesus is our example and he lived like we lived. He was not born with the perfect knowledge, like as a four-year-old, that he knew who he was as the son of God. He actually had to find himself in the scriptures. And the reason I'm saying that is this. Uh, Joe gave the example, but as I, as I went back to it, it makes sense. Remember when, when uh, G uh, Mary and Joseph left Jesus behind? And uh, they went looking for him. They were frantic, trying to find him, and, uh, and went looking for him. And it says in Luke, this is not on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. Now it was that after three days they found him in the temple... He was sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Now, here's my question to you. If he knew already had perfect knowledge, why would he be listening to the teachers and asking them questions? In fact, if you, when we follow the life of Jesus, outside of this thing, he'd never, list, he'd never find him listening to the Jewish teachers again. He'd never find him asking any questions. He started declaring who he was. But when he was 12 years old, he was trying to find out who he was. I can hear the wheels turning. <laughs> and there's a, there's a reason I, I want to discuss this. Because Jesus had to find his identity in the scriptures. You say, well, Alan, do you have another scripture for that? I do. Same chapter, Luke, I mean, same book, book of Luke. In Luke 24, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, how many of you remember the road to Emmaus story? A couple of guys on the road to Emmaus, they're walking and Jesus joins them and they don't recognize him. They don't recognize that it's Jesus. Evidently after Jesus, in our resurrected bodies, it appears that we may have the ability to change appearance. Ooh. Brad Pitt, look out. <laughs> but Jesus popped up beside him, started talking to him. He said, why are you guys so sad? And they said... Are you the only guy in Israel that hadn't heard this? And they began to tell him about Jesus and, and how that they thought he was the one and how he was the Messiah and, and how they had crucified him. But, and, and they were so sad. And it said here that Jesus said in verse 25, he said, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So when Jesus, Jesus appeared to these guys, he didn't even go, hey, look, it's me, it's Jesus. He took them back and began to tell them in all the scriptures. Do you realize that when Jesus was growing up, Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, there were, there were hints and places in there where it began to talk about this is who he was. And Jesus got a revelation of who he was. He wasn't born with it. Listen, I don't care what anybody else said. Jesus wasn't healing little children at six years old and, and restoring bird wings. Jesus didn't do any miracles until he hit 30 years old and was filled with the Holy Spirit when, when he was baptized by John. In fact, the Bible said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing. Y'all looking at me like I'm blaspheming here. Stay with me. I, I just, <laughs> hang on. Jesus even had to find himself in the scriptures. And that gives us an example that if Jesus found himself in the scriptures, then the best way for us to begin to establish our spiritual identity is to do the exact same thing. We begin to find ourselves in the scriptures. So, and you say, well, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, here's, the, we got a saying around here. Don't get mad. It's scripture. Just going, but you're going to find that, that he, he did this. Remember, he's our example. Remember? 
He's our example. Remember, he was tempted in all points as we are, yet he didn't sin. He's our example. He felt some of the same things we felt. He dealt with some of the same things we dealt with. He never yielded to sin. He was still sinless and spotless. Right? Yes. Okay, good. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. So what, what does that got to do with us? We begin to identify with who we are in Christ. That's Galatians, the third chapter. Let's look at this. For you were all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul, his, it, Paul's revelations that Paul had that he began to share with all that what you see in the epistles is one of the revelations he's sharing is what's happened to us when we made Jesus our Lord. And we made Jesus our Lord. And what's happened so often is people said, oh, great, I've made Jesus my Lord. I get to go to heaven. That's wonderful. And that is wonderful. That's really good. But a lot more happened than that. And what happened to that is Paul began to say, if anyone is in Christ, you've heard me quote this. If anyone is Christ, he is what? He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. How many of you know that when you became a, a new creation in Christ, your physical appearance did not change? True. Joyce said she was so disappointed when her skin did not clear up the day after she made Jesus her Lord. She woke up and she still had skin complexion problems. And so that, that, that bothered her. But what happens is we become new on the inside, correct? Yes. 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 And so Paul is writing and he's saying, hey, if you've been baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. Hey, if anyone is in Christ, he has a relationship with Christ. You are not the same person that you used to be. You have become a new creation in Christ and your spiritual identity actually outweighs the other things. Paul is, Paul is saying that in Christ, because our spiritual identity is up here, then it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek. Because your spiritual identity is up here, it doesn't matter if you're a slave or free. Because our spiritual identity is in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're male or female. He's not advocating a genderless society. He's just saying that your spiritual identity overrides everything else. That's the identity. That's how we get into heaven. When we get to heaven, you're not going to go, I'm a good man. That's not enough. I'm a I was raised in the South. That's not enough. I'm Protestant. That's not enough. To get into heaven, you've got to say, I belong to Jesus Christ. I've been baptized into him. I'm unified with him. And they say, welcome, come on in. This is not, you're going to have to visit with St. Peter and he's not going to weigh you're good and you're bad. No, you get to do that when you get your rewards. Amen. But when you, to get in, you've got to be born again. I'm going to say that again. To get in, you've got to be born again. That's how you get in. But listen, when we're down here, we need to begin then to focus on what our spiritual identity is as opposed to our natural identity. And here's where it really, here's where the rubber hits the road. I believe too many people are focusing on the weaknesses that they are here instead of the strength that we have here. Amen. People say, well, you know, Alan, I'm just a, I'm just a worrier. <laughs> Whole family was a worrier. And they identify with being a worrier. Some people say, you know what? I, man, I've got an addiction. I just can't kick this addiction. I'm addicted. I'm addicted. I'm just addicted. People say, well, I, I, I'm a people pleaser. I'm this. And people identify so much with their weak areas that they're not identifying with the strength that they have in Christ. The strength that we have in Christ is stronger than the weak areas in our life. So instead of me saying, I'm fearful, I'm a worrier, I'm this, I begin to say that in Christ, I'm more than a conqueror through him who loved me. That becomes my identity. Does this make sense? And what happens, what I've just seen so much is that people keep focusing on lower level stuff instead of rising up to who we are. Who, who are you? We all say, I'm a believer. Not, no, nah, well, I'm a, I'm a Texan fan. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Houstonian and I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. I'm a Christian. Then I'm a Houstonian. Then I'm a Texan. Did you catch that? I'm a Christian before I'm a Texan. 
Oh, that's not blasphemy. I know I said it in Texas, but y'all, y'all got to stay with me. So we, we've got to go, we've got to go and focus on who we are in Christ and what we have. Now in Romans, the eighth chapter, the Bible said, Romans 8, 2, it said, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. But how many times have we said, I've just got this problem, I've just got this problem, I've just got this problem. Now Keith Moore tells a story, and I'm going to borrow his story. I'll give him credit for it because didn't, it didn't happen to me. He said a guy walked into uh, his, his meeting, and uh, I think he was, he was teaching, and the guy said, he said, Keith, he said, man, I, I want to get free from cigarettes. He said, but I'm addicted to nicotine. He said, I, I really want to get free, but I'm addicted to nicotine. Keith said, he must have said it 10 times. I'm addicted to nicotine. I'm addicted to nicotine. Keith said, okay. He said, he said I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something. Will you do it? And he said, don't ask me to throw my cigarettes away. He said, I've thrown away a fortune's worth of cigarettes. I've driven back on the road and picked it up. And by the way, guys, you do understand that smoking cigarettes is not going to send you to hell. Do you understand that? Smoking cigarettes is, is just a habit and it's not, it's not going to separate you from God. You might meet him quicker than everybody else, but he's not, <laughs> it's not going to send you to hell. It's not, the, it's not the sin. So for all you cigarette smokers, lighten up. Don't worry about it. But here's the deal. If you want to get free from it, you can get free from it. Now, Keith said, look, well, you do what I ask you to do. And he said, Keith, don't ask me to, don't ask me to throw away my cigarettes. I've thrown away a fortune's worth of cigarettes. I just can't do it because I'm addicted to nicotine. He said, one, stop saying you're addicted to nicotine. He said, two, will you do what I ask you to do? He said, all right. He said, every time you pull out a cigarette, say, thank God I am free from nicotine. He said, but I'm going to be smoking. He said, you're already smoking. He said, but he said, every time you, you light that cigarette up, say, thank God I'm free from nicotine. He said, but I'm going to be smoking. He said, you're already smoking. Just do this. He said, when you put it out, say, thank God I'm free from nicotine. When you tap out a new one, say, thank God I'm free from nicotine. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. That's a higher identity than I'm addicted to nicotine. True? Okay, no, so, <laughs> Keith, Keith said, hey, God said, Keith said, will you do what I say? He said, but I'm addicted. He said, no, no, stop saying I'm addicted to nicotine. He said, okay. He said, two weeks later, he's in a meeting and said, this guy comes through and his face was lit up like a neon light. He said, guess what? He said, you're free from nicotine. He said, I am. He said, man, he said, when you told me to do that, he said, I thought it sounded crazy. He said, but I thought I've tried everything else. Might as well try this. He said, so he said, it became a habit with me. I'd get a cigarette out first thing in the morning, light up. Thank God I'm free from nicotine. He said, I'd put it out, light another one. Thank God I'm free from nicotine. He said, it became a habit with me. He said, I'm standing on a corner he said, I take my last drag, and he said, and I threw it in the gutter. And I said, thank God I'm free from nicotine. He said, and it hit me. I'm free from nicotine. He said, I am free from nicotine. And what happened was he finally began to identify with the freedom he had in Christ as opposed to the addiction he felt in his flesh. He said, haven't had another cigarette. I don't have a desire for cigarettes. He said, I'm free from nicotine. What was he doing? He began to identify the spiritual. If we're going to be strong in the Lord, then we're going to have to be strong in what he says about us and not the weak areas of our life. Too many people are saying things like, oh, you know, I'm just a lousy Christian. I'm a lousy Christian. I'm in and out and in and out. Or they'll say things like, you know what, I just, man, I've got this problem in my flesh and I can't beat it and I can't beat it and I can't beat it. No, instead of saying that, why don't we begin to find in the scriptures what God says we are and begin to focus on that. He says you're more than a conqueror through him who loved you. He yeah. says he's redeemed you from the curse of the law. He says the law of the, of the, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. You say, well, Ellen, how come I'm, if I'm supposed to be free, how come I'm not free? Because you've never made it yours. Yep. Yep. You've never said, this is who I am. I'm a, Ellen, I'm a, I'm just a people pleaser. <laughs> well, if I walked up to you and said, hey, how's my little people pleaser? <laughs> you might look at me and go, don't call me that. You wouldn't want me to call you that. 
So why are you calling yourself that? Why don't we do what the scriptures say and find out what it says in the scriptures that we are and begin to say the same thing? I mean, y'all are so quiet. Are you listening? Okay. I'll give you an example. I just keep with examples. I believe, you, I believe you're getting this. So you could go, you could go to like Romans 8, and it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. I'd stop right there and go, thank you, Lord. I am led by the Spirit of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So the Bible says that. So guess what we can say about ourselves? I haven't received the spirit of bondage again to fear. I've received the spirit of adoption. And I cry out, Abba, Father, God, you're my Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How many of you believe you're a child of God? How many of you believe God does not have spiritual birth defects? And that they're not different classes of children of God. If you're a child of God, then you are a child of God. And the Bible says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Are you hearing where I'm going with this? We have, to, we have to do what John the Baptist did and do what Jesus did and go into the scriptures and begin to find out who we are. And instead of saying, well, you know, I might say, well, if us God, I know I'm a man. I'm not saying you have to drop being a man. <laughs> if, you, if you are one, good. But that's not the highest level of, of spiritual truth in your life. The spiritual truth in your life is you're in Christ. You're a new creation in him. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And so instead of hanging on to our weaknesses and talking about our weaknesses all the time, why don't we talk about the strength that we have in him? I've never heard you guys so quiet on a Wednesday night. <laughs> But can you see where we've made the mistake of continuing to talk about I'm this and I'm that and I have this problem and I have that problem? I did this a number of years ago. You know, it said in 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. Now, here, here's one thing we can say. You're going to love this. I'm dead to sin and I live for righteousness. Now, I know what some of you think. I can hear you thinking, I don't know, Alan. I wouldn't be willing to say I'm dead to sin. I'm not dead to sin because just this today, I, you know, I did some things that I shouldn't have done. In fact, I said some things coming up here because the traffic was bad, and I said some things I shouldn't have said. And so I'm not dead to sin. But the Bible says you are dead to sin. So which one are you going to join? Which one are you going to agree with? And here's the thing, if we begin to say, instead of saying, I'm addicted to this, I'm addicted to that, I can't beat this, I can't beat that, why don't we just begin to say, God, you've made me your child, I am yours, and whatever you say I am is exactly what I am, and that's what I'm going to say. And we, but here's the deal, don't just walk out of here and go, I'm gonna try that, I'm gonna try that for a couple of weeks and see if it works. No, 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 this is a lifestyle. This is something we're always growing in. This is something we have a, a, a wonderful, when you hit heaven, do you think the Lord's gonna look at you and go, well, there you are, my little people pleaser. <laughs> He's gonna look at you and go, there you are, my child. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. You are more than a conqueror. Welcome to heaven where you belong in God's family. And if you belong in God's family, there's no sense in acting like you are a second class citizen who cannot do what the scriptures say you can do. So just go ahead and jump in with both feet. What have you got to lose? Yes. You say, well, Alan, that's just weird. <laughs> no, it's not weird. It's spiritual and it's different. It's different from the way most of us were raised. I was raised in a Christian home. My dad had me learn a verse early on. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
He was simply, but he was simply trying to help me develop a can-do attitude. He was not telling me, this is your identity in Christ. But wouldn't it make sense if we helped our children establish their identity in Christ? Then when their other identities get attacked, they've got something solid to hang on to. Does that make sense? Well, I hope I did good with this. It preached better at home. <laughs> but I, I, really, I really think, listen to me just as your pastor, I really think this has been one of our big, big uh, trouble areas, that we're speaking way too much and identifying way too much with the weaknesses in our life instead of the, the strength that we have in Christ. Amen. That, that is, is part of the problem. And it can change. But here's the beautiful thing. It can change. And by you speaking what you are in Christ, that doesn't change God. It makes it real to you. And when it becomes personal, it becomes powerful. And when you get a revelation of it, the more that revelation comes, the stronger you become. And then you begin to stay, instead of saying, well, I just don't know if I can live this Christian life, you begin to go, thank you, Lord. I'm going to live this life. I'm going to live it strong. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Would you bow your head for a moment? Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you came this evening and said, you know, Alan, I appreciate all that stuff. But I don't even know if I'm a Christian. I don't even know if, if I have a relationship with the Lord. Or maybe you're saying to yourself, I used to have a relationship with God and I've gotten away from him. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, we're going to say a prayer. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come down to the front. But where you're sitting, right where you are. You can make a connection with the Lord that will absolutely change your eternity and change your life. So we want to give you a chance to do that. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking. I'm looking. But if that's you and you say, Alan, I've been away from God, or Alan, I don't even know if I have a relationship with him, would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up just across the auditorium? Say this to me, thank you, thanks. Thank you, yeah, thanks. Thanks, anybody else? Great, thank you. Yeah, we in the back, I got you. You can put your hands down. Maybe you didn't lift your hand. You wanted to. And uh, you didn't miss your opportunity. This is a great prayer. We can pray. We're going to pray together as a church family. We ask you to join. If you're watching online, you're by yourself, pray with us out loud. If you're, if you're with others, pray it quietly. But this is such a powerful prayer. This is what takes the gospel and makes it personal for you. Say, dear God, I know mankind needs a Savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. Heads are still bowed and eyes are closed. Father, thank you for those who have prayed that prayer, for those who've made that decision, or for those who've come back to you, for those who received you for the very first time. Thank you for that. And Father, thank you for a continual revelation of who you say we are. Your words, higher words, stronger words, a better identity. Thank you for that. We give you all the praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer this evening, we're so glad for that. We really are. And so uh, there's, a, there's a QR code. If you scan that, we'll get, we'll get some information to you. We'll pray for you. There's a card by your feet. If you're here, if you're online, your scan is your best way to go. And we'll be praying for you every week. We do love you. We're praying for you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We love you. We're praying for you. See you.